Hello, friends, and welcome to the uh, Safer uh, Play Talk at Big Bad Con Online. My name is Jason Morningstar, and with me is Johanna Koljonen. Uh, and we're going to talk about safer play, uh, participation safety, and tabletop and live action play. We're going to be focusing on design and implementation. Uh, and as a note, we're going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions if you have any. So, uh, Johanna, could you introduce yourself to us? That's so difficult. <laughs> it's like my least favorite part of every sorry. every panel. Uh, I, I, I'm. I mean, I guess in this context, I'm a LARP theorist. Basically, I'm. I'm. A, I'm a LARP maker. Uh, LARP right is a wonderful word that we like to use in Europe. It's very pompous, um, but I think uh, sort of historically, my my focus has often been on understanding uh, games backwards uh, and experiences and participation more broadly, uh, rather than designing new things. Even though I do that as well, it's driven by this passion to understand this medium. And I'm Jason Morningstar. I'm the creative director at Bully Pulpit Games. So primarily I'm a, a game designer in analog tabletop and live action spaces as well. Uh, I should so probably say we have a studio as well. Sorry, I no, oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, Participation Design Agency is the name of my studio. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> so uh, safer play uh, is uh, something that is uh, very uh, central to what both of us do. And I thought it would be fun to get us together and just have a conversation about that. Uh, so I've got a list of questions. Uh, we're going to talk for a, a little while about those. And then we're going to welcome uh, your questions as well. So uh, if it's OK with you, I'm just going to just jump into the, the questions that we, we came up with for the, for the talk. Sure. So uh, who is responsible uh, for participant safety at an event or at a tabletop? So as an, a Northern European, to me, this is not a legal question at all. Uh, <laughs> litigation doesn't come into it. So I'll save that for, for, for your American perspective. Uh, but sort of ethically and practically, I mean, you could say everybody's responsible, but then, of course, that's too broad. So it, it doesn't mean anything. But I mean, everyone is responsible. Everyone has to create it together. Uh, that said, a lot of things, you know, also as, as an organizer of a thing, uh, we often say that even the things that are not your fault are always and always your responsibility, right? So, so when when a problem emerges, if you haven't prevented it, it ends up being your responsibility. Uh, so, it, anyway, and in any kind of crisis situation, even if you have a very collective way of of creating games, um, in a crisis, people will look to the person with the highest authority to to solve things. So, I think in a very practical sense, usually it's going to be you as the designer or the organizer of, of an event who has to have the proactive sort of responsibility and as a designer i think it's core to what we do yeah i agree uh, I, I think it's important to to uh, emphasize though that uh, participants are responsible both for their own and the safety of others uh, and uh, facilitators as well like it's a it, it doesn't land squarely on a, a single individual Right. I mean, you could argue also that in a way, the whole po the, your responsibility as a designer is enabling the participants to to take responsibility for their own safety. I I think that's a good, yeah. It's a simplification, but if you can, if you have achieved that, you're like almost at the goal. Well, if we're talking about simplification, then uh, the next question is: Is it possible to have a perfectly safe experience? Uh, I will resist the simplification then, <laughs> because then we have to talk about what is safe, right? So I think we're talking at least about safety as opposed to danger, uh, safety as opposed to harm, uh, safety as opposed to, uh, to, to risk. And I think it, already it's a little bit more difficult to say, what, well, what is perfectly safe then? Um, regardless of how well designed something is, the participants will always bring themselves. You know, they're going to bring their baggage. Uh, they're going to bring the, the shape they're in that day. And so will you, uh, I still think. And, and you know, my experience is that when actually dangerous situations happen uh, at LARP events, for instance, and I mean, I come a lot from the perspective of multi-day LARP events, but it could also be in the com context of a convention, for instance. If something actually dangerous happens, it's because somebody hasn't slept, right? So so the then even even my sort of the shape I'm in on the day uh, will affect it. So you, you can't, you could probably create an almost perfectly safe experience 
but then you would have to have no participants, I think, and your design, <laughs> and you'd have to be in perfect shape yourself. You know, everything has to be in place. So it's unlikely to be perfect, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive for it, right? Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's a, a very uh, very smart way to, to, to position that question. Um, so we're really talking about uh, uh, front-loading uh, the designer experience in this talk. I think yeah. our audience is primarily going to be people who are who are making games, uh, and uh, it's clear to me that we as designers need to care about participant safety. Um, but where's the line between culture of play and how much that you can articulate in a, a body of rules or a set of instructions? Uh, and how can you communicate the difference? I think that's interesting. You said participant safety. And I, I just intuitively, I feel like I'm maybe that's the, the limit. Like for me, maybe the participant's safety is the participant's responsibility. For me, and this thing myths is horrible. I don't know. I just literally realized for me, it's about participation safety, right? So, so safety is about, broadly speaking, two things. It's about being safe and feeling safe. And I think that if you don't feel at least somewhat self safe, you can't participate in a creative uh, endeavor at all. So I see it as a sort of like necessity of the form to have some level of, of, of safety in the participation. Like if, you're, if you're genuinely making participatory work, then you have to care about safety for the participation to be even viable. Um, and I, I think even in the context of sort of edge play or, or like dark play situations, to have be able to have a playful, a playful attitude to play with something, you need to know what's the serious parts and what's the playful, like what are the things we're playing with here. So, and intuitively participants often do. And, and when problems uh, emerge, it tends to be when they're not in agreement and their expectations are different about what things are we playing with here and what things are we definitely not playing with here, both in terms of content, but also as in like, what are we taking seriously and what aren't we taking seriously? Um, so, and from that perspective, then to return to the question, I, I inevitably it becomes quite a lot about the culture of play, um, but a, to me, a rule system or, or safety, rules is one expression, an important expression um, of that culture of safety. But, but you, if you can't, I mean, you can't, you can articulate it in rules and, and, and in the tone of your culture. But if it isn't also delivered, like if you don't live that culture, if the participants don't create that culture together, then of course they might feel safe, but they are not actually safe. That's an important distinction. And I think that leads into the next thing I want to talk about. And I'm hoping that you can just Give us some definitions here. Uh, can you mm -hmm. talk about the difference between calibration and safety? Yes. Uh, and I should say that I had worked on this topic for literally, I think, like four years before I realized that they are completely different things. Uh, and I think safety to me is about like safety from, like I said, safe, the, that's about danger and harm and, mm -hmm. and, and some aspects of risk. But then calibration is about playing well together, you know, uh, about about. So that's also about risk, but that's often about mitigating social risk and about enabling and also about enabling the participants to uh, to fully express themselves or to fully participate in content and also to choose to not to participate in content, which is completely key to safety. Um, and of course, I, I, I mean, I think it's good for all participants to know more or less what they're getting into uh, so that they can opt out of things that, selecting the right content for you is key. Uh, but then this is a medium that has emergent content, no matter what you do. So, so there's no situation, I think, where you, where you wouldn't also need some kind of mechanism for, uh, for opting out or for adjusting the intensity so that you don't have to opt out. And that's where calibration comes in. So calibrating the experience you know, for you, once you're in the right experience, you still can like optimize it for, for your sense of safety, but also for your play style and for what you're enjoying, right? That's also important, maybe even more important to create Perhaps that. More uh, important. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fun it being you... important also in games, not yeah, just the serious things. Yep. There, do you think, um, you think there's a universal baseline that there are essential and universal tools or techniques or meta techniques that we should by default include in any playful experience or participative experience? 
No, and you knew I would say that. <laughs> then, again, many many yeah. of these questions are, are loaded, yes. Yeah, no, um, I, I think that there are no, it's really important that there aren't any universal rules. And as a designer of safety tools, I find it very interesting that participants sometimes try to introduce, like when I am running something, participants will come to me with techniques that I have literally designed or been part of designing. I said, but we should use this because it's always good. And I'm like, no, like it's it's actually not the best fit for this context or for this game or for these participants or for this day. Um, I think it's really important that you have to have, like with any other aspect of game design, uh, you need to have a bespoke safety design um, system. You need to think about what it's for or who it's for um, and the situation it's for. And actually, I think maybe I'd like to throw something in here, which is safe for whom. Um, That's okay. yep. Because I think there's a big distinction now, if you're listening to this, depending on are you thinking about the, about what we're talking about in the context of, let's say, how I'm already running a thing or I've already designed a thing. How can I make it safer? And then it's the other thing, which is like, because then probably you have a specific group of players or an implicit group of players or some expectations around that. And how do you design for them? And then the question is, who isn't currently feeling safe or being safe in this piece of work or in this culture? And that is a very tough question because, of course, if they're not feeling safe or being safe, that part of that might be because of you. You might be the problem. So that's that's a whole can of worms to get into. But it's such uh, rewarding work when you do it because your game becomes more inclusive. But on the other side, it's like I want to make a new thing, and then you need to think about well, who should we include? Who should this be for? And I've met designers, and I feel like I've, they've always been American. This might be a coincidence. But I've, I've felt met designers who are very serious about, about this stuff, who feel, for instance, that every LARP should be playable to people with active PTSD. And I, this is a condition that I myself have been diagnosed with. So I feel like I'm speaking with some authority when I say uh, I think it's absurd you know, to say that, that all LARPs should be inclusive on that level. Uh, I think that's a very difficult design uh, restriction to set yourself. You can absolutely make LARPs that are playable for people with PTSD, but it's very tough. And then you're, then there's a lot of work that you're not making. So I think a more reasonable goal is how do I include as many people, as many players and kinds of players as possible for this piece of work that I'm making? And also how do I make damn sure that the people who become automatically excluded in some way are not the same people every time? And, and that's another aspect of this that speaks more to designing um, like cultures or, or communities of participation. And accessibility, of course, comes into this. But in accessibility, we don't find it controversial to say, okay, like one person's, uh, the thing that helps one person might hinder another person. Sorry, I forget what it's called in English. Um, adjustments, right? So I have players, we have players who come to our things that, that are uh, helped by the lighting not being very bright. And we have players who cannot see in dim lighting. They can't play at the same time, basically. and But that doesn't mean that either of these groups of people deserve to play less than the others. So then we have to think about maybe let's not always have the inviting in our lives, for instance, or whatever it is. And I think with, with designing for safety, it's a similar set of choices. Not every LARP or, or game will be for everyone. And I don't want to say like that's okay, because I mean, I mean, in a way it's not okay, but it's it's just the way it is. Yeah, I think that's a, an excellent point. And the, the analogy to uh, accessible uh, uh, content or accessibility is, is apt. Uh, it's not going to work for uh, one cohort, but it'll, it'll be effective for another. Uh, and uh, that's something that just needs to be uh, communicated. I think that that's an issue of communication so that people understand what they're getting into and can and, opt out. And yeah, and that also goes back to like, are there some techniques that can be universal? Well, no, no, I think not, because because the what techniques are are necessary and what techniques will work it depends so much on on who the the players are in any specific situation, and so well, that's I, when you make the choices. Sure, and, that, and that's uh, a, good, a good segue because I want to talk about trust a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. So, what role does trust play in choosing the tools that you're going to use? Uh, thinking specifically here about the difference between playing with a trusted group of friends and playing with strangers, for example. Well, I mean, I mean, so it's all about trust on some level, right? Because trust is is required for risk taking. So then, trust would be required for creativity, uh, mm -hmm. or certainly participation. Certainly, anything where you're putting yourself on the line by acting in front of other people, which is what we do in role playing. Um, so, so 
in some way, I think designing a play culture is all about designing trust. Um, but then there's also some flip sides of that, which is that trust can also blind us maybe a little from uh, if we trust our co-players, so these are my friends, I've played with them for years, I might not pay attention to like yeah. the risks I'm taking with myself. And also there's some just bad practice that happens very often, which is, okay, but this LARP or this, this tabletop game has these safety features. We're not going to use them because we trust each other. Yep. Or we yep. know each other. Happen. Yep. I've and it's it like, happen. no, like we don't actually know each other or we do, but that doesn't, they're there for a reason. And I, I feel, of course, as a designer, that the participant should respect our work enough to use our mechanics, <laughs> which is tough because I'm very open to them, like making household or like, what, what are they called? Like house rules for anything else. Mm. But I don't believe in house rules when it comes to safety. Uh, so at, le at the very least, like if you want to tamper with those in, in your session, I think you have to have a conversation with everybody about how and why do you do that. Um, but, but in a bigger game, no, you don't get to make the decision for everybody else. Like you don't actually get to make the decision for everybody else that you guys are not going to be using these tools when, when you interact with each other, because it's also going to direct your play to what you experience as a lower threshold interaction. Um, and then you are um, missing out on other people's contributions. So uh, are there, this is, uh, we're jumping a little bit uh, to one side, but uh, are there, and this again is a, a leading question because I know there are, <clears throat> there are a couple good answers to this. Um, are there aspects of participatory experience that are often overlooked in terms of their ability to support safety or calibration? Um, yeah, I, I think it's about that you model the culture in everything you do. And I think like in your work, for instance, uh, when in your physical products, they're so beautiful and you put so much effort into how the visual uh, surface supports the game design and the experience of play. And I think this is kind of the exact same thing even when, when people are making more intangible things like like uh, event-based uh, designs that of course you have to be consistent in in everything you do so the your tone in your communication and your consistency and your predictability in your communication with your participants um and very much tone in the sense of the, the language you use uh, the the pronouns you use do you talk about we who is a we when you email your participants this kind of thing where do you build the communities how do you onboard people who haven't played your work before or who haven't maybe played at all before, which is another difficult uh, you know, thing, a choice that we need, need to, to make is how do, we, how, do we make, how do we onboard people who need a lot of information without making the people who don't need that information glaze over on some reading, for instance. So, so putting a lot of effort into that. And just as a practical thing, just having somebody, for instance, on site you know, at the door welcoming people, looking them in the eye and saying hi, you're welcome. Because everybody feels, everybody, I think, feels uncomfortable or or a little bit shy when they show up in a new place, or at least uncertain about like, where am I supposed to go and what am I supposed to do now? So if somebody is standing there saying, hi, welcome, you're in the right place, we're happy to see you, your coat goes there and the bathrooms are there and we're gonna start in here in, in 10 minutes. You're like, that is part of your safety design. That makes people, and if you can create an activity, like maybe some chairs need moving. So often we need, like, I, I need chairs moving. I'm not gonna move, I, I could move the chairs more efficiently, or like my staff could move the chair, chairs more efficiently. But we're gonna ask the participants to do it together because they're nervous and they need something to do with their hands. And then they have something, they can solve a small trivial problem together. And then they, they will, that's already a team building activity basically for, for the ensemble. Uh, and and everything you do on site needs to be in support or everything that happens when you set up the game needs to be in support of the culture you're trying to achieve. We're, we're starting to get some questions, so I'm going to uh, right. move to those. So here's one. As a marginalized person, I think the hardest part in recognizing when I'm feeling unsafe and how I'm so often socially pressured to feel safe. How as designers and players can we help people connect better to their own sense of safety? That's a question that we've just received. And I think it's a great one. That's a great one. I have an answer. Do you have an answer, Jason? Because I don't have a great answer, I think. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know that I have a great answer to this question. Um, it, certainly as a, as a designer, um, you the tools that you, well, and this, this there's a, I have another question for this around the, the uh, 
tools that are proactive versus tools that are reactive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's a, a let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a challenging design space, right? Because what what I think that this question really is asking that same thing, right? Um, many of the many of the tools that we use require the person who is feeling unsafe to say, "I am feeling unsafe." I've recognized that about myself, and I am interrupting the flow of this activity for my own benefit. And yeah. we we give a lot of lip service to, well, you can apply these tools to other people that you observe are in distress as well, but that's a that's a pretty high level ask. I think yeah. and it's unrealistic to and, and and it's rare that you see that happen in, in practice. Yeah, especially uh, in the kinds of art that I make that are often about the top, you know, like possession, like horror, personal horror. You'll see a lot of people act very naturalistically as though they're in distress. Uh, so so the bar to to interrupt them is tough. Yeah, I, I, this is uh, I think this is a. It's such a, a difficult topic. I remember when I went to um, College of Wizardry, and of course, that's you know people from lots of different cultures that play together. Uh, and in my culture of play, we don't really privilege immersion that much. And uh, I saw people in distress, and I immediately would ask if they needed help. Mm. It just it was just a, an instinct of mine, and people would get really upset. I had to learn to to tone that down and calibrate that because people were having a glorious time, deeply yeah, immersed yeah. in their own scene. And and I was interrupting them or causing, causing cathartically crying, yeah. But right. then that becomes about play culture, right? So then the, there yeah. it you yeah. can have less intrusive mechanisms. Like you have, you can have discrete uh, um, checking met methods for checking in, uh, and you can you can enforce a play culture where people will always thank you for checking in. Or, or for stating a boundary, for instance. But that's something you have to practice together. And that's something where, because of course, if you have, I mean, inevitably, I think all situations, all human situations have some kind of status hierarchy. Some people will will be looked up to for sort of leadership or for, for tone. And I think it's important to make sure that you, all everybody on the crew, but also people who, who may have some high status in the, in the play situation because of fictional or, or non, non diegetic reasons, that they can, that they really lean into using the safety tools and to maybe make sure, sometimes, you know, a social hack that you can do is that you make sure that somebody who plays a very visible character uses it very early on in a visible mm -hmm. situation. Like you can even set that up if you, if you want to, I mean, you know, or you talk to the person and, and make sure that they're less shy about it so that they demonstrate the behavior and that can help. But I think it doesn't quite speak to the question we got from from the, the viewer as a marginalized person or indeed as anyone. This is very, very hard, but extra hard as a marginalized person. And then I think it's important to build in uh, reflection time. You can build into the mechanisms, for instance, that everybody has to count to five be before they're doing an action or or that you're doing things very slowly or that when there's a check in that you, ha you, are, you are enforcing that people do need to take a moment to sort of think about it. Or that you have to break character, you have to break the situation, depending on the lark. You have to step out of the room every, you know, every once in a while, and, and to have some kind of breaks built in. We have this assumption that aesthetically it somehow harms the, the game, and in the situation going moving forwards through the game, it might feel like there's a pro, you know, that it's an annoying to have to take a little break to 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 check in with yourself. But retroactively, that disappears, right? The brain edits it out, so it the, the it does not make the uh, experience of the game less powerful at all uh, after the fact. It makes it better because you were able to lean in harder because you felt that you that you knew that you were safe or that you felt good about what you were doing. I can also uh, address this question with an example or a game that I'm working on right now. Uh, one of the things that you you're presented with 30 medical conditions as a group, and in the instructions prior to play, I say, have everybody look them over and just discard any that they don't want to deal with in play uh, yeah. for whatever reason. Uh, and uh, as the facilitator, do this first, pick one and discard it, even if you would be happy playing with all of them, because yeah. you're modeling the behavior you want to see, uh, which uh, I think is like, the, and that's a procedural note that I put in that forces you to model that behavior. Other people see you as a higher status person facilitating the game doing this thing, then they're more likely to do it as well because they have some alibi and permission to do that. Yeah. I think also just a, in a practical sense, sometimes we often have, I mean, so the, a lot of the LARPs that I'm involved with are incredibly physical. 
uh, and some some have, have sensual content. For instance, a lot of touching. And the text. So I mean, it's 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 a, a a design challenge to take a group of strangers. Often, you know, make feel and you have maybe maybe eight hours, often less, to make them feel comfortable touching each other. And of course, culturally, this is different in the U.S. versus versus Europe. In in the U.S., it would be harder. Or in my experience, it is harder. But but still, like you to get to get players into a place where where they can do those kinds of things, you will have to do exercises that in themselves are uncomfortable. And you can be very transparent about the process. I think you can be very transparent about the design. We're doing this now, which is uncomfortable. Like we're going with a classic exercise in my kind of life is we're going to do the uncomfortably long hug exercise. <laughs> and it's going to feel like this. It's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to feel nice and it's going to feel uncomfortable again, you know. And then people hug each other and then that is uncomfortable and then it feels nice and then it's uncomfortable, you know. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, my, my discomfort is part of this process. It's normal. Um, but you, it's also important to say, if you're not comfortable doing this exercise right now, for any reason, you can stand by the wall and just watch the others do it because it's it's really about the witnessing the emotions is just as powerful almost as, as going through them. Uh, and it still creates that, that feeling of doing things together. So, so enabling opting out while still taking people on the journey that they're going on together, there's something there that is incredibly vital to, to what we're talking about here. Um, yeah. We have another question, which is, uh, do you see change and hopefully improvement in what tools people use and how they use them? And the answer to that is yes, uh, I think, clearly. The example I gave about College of Wizardry, I just didn't have the tools. And they didn't have the tools to tell me discreetly, to signal that they were not in distress in real life. Uh, yeah. And I didn't have the tools to ask that question. And I think now, uh, at, at a game like that, I would. I absolutely would. Um, and I think if you play more games like that, you become more adept at also seeing, okay, but is this a kind of performative distress, whether it's very big or, or very sort of small. Uh, and often it's the people who are not making a lot of noise that you like that. Those are the people you have to check in with, but they will also be, you know, they're often, you know, I, there's this joke in Europe about, about Finnish role players. Like we can just immerse on alone, like on LARP alone in a closet and it would still be a powerful experience. And I, I genuinely come from that play culture. But even when I'm alone, like it's, it's kind of nice when I'm playing alone, to know that somebody has noticed. So if somebody, if somebody uh, checks in with me, actually it confirms to me that yeah, okay, I am still in the same market as these other people. So so ultimately, it's a it's a positive uh, positive thing. But it's important to like you, these are the kinds of these are the kinds of these are the dis dis design challenges around safety mechanics, right? That we're talking about here, and that's where I'm I'm seeing progress, but I'm also seeing some some problems. Is that people are looking at this as something that can be mechanically solved without designing a culture around it. And I don't think that that actually works. And I see a lot of uh, some of our LARP some websites, for instance, um, you know, have, have some language that we have worked on for years to communicate precisely what it's for and what, the, what your minimum level of comfort should be to interact in physical interactions with a stranger and so on. And the people are copy pasting this to put on their LARP websites. And that's very nice. And then sometimes they don't read it through. Like I, I looked at a very high profile event recently where it said a sentence that I have written originally that says something along, along the lines of you will always be in control of, of who you touch and who touches you or something like this. And then in the previous sentence, they had added something like you, can, you, might, be, um, you might be blindfolded. Uh, yeah, as part like one of the things that can happen is LARP is you might be blindfolded. And I, 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 I contacted them and I said, I'm sorry, but like, feel free to adapt our work. But you, at least it has to make sense. Like you have to read through your own rules and see if this is consistent. If, you, if you're blindfolded, you're not in control of who touches you at any given time. Then you can't opt out of everything that's happening to you. And you have to make a choice. It's one or the other. And they changed the language. I can't remember which if they took away the blindfolds or if they took away the language. But, but this is the kind of thing that people are, are not great. You know, even people who are great at making beautiful LARPs aren't always great at just thinking through this in a logical fashion. Like, well, how will this actually play out in a room? And I think, uh, at least in, in the United States, there's a real desire to have a standardized solution. So you, so you see, for example, conventions that say, we're going to have the X card on every table for mm -hmm. tabletop games, and we expect you to use it. And, you know, like, that's, that's not, that doesn't solve the problem. Right. No. So I mean, it might be better than nothing, but it, then you have to know that it's not always going to work, and then it, maybe it's safety theater. <laughs> then. Exactly. No. That's I think that's my concern is that there, there will be people who use it uh, incorrectly, people who don't 
understand it and don't use it, people who reject it, uh, games mm -hmm. for which it's completely inappropriate, players for which it's completely inappropriate. So Yeah, I have a, like a nerdy observation about this. And I think that uh, part of it comes from just the big cultural difference in the sort of Nordic art tradition that I grew up in and that I design in still. We've always worked with bespoke rules, uh, or not always, but like for decades now, uh, it tends to be bespoke rules, unless it's like a big fantasy campaign and those exist in our play culture as well. Most of the time when you go to LARP, it's going to be a new set of rules that is optimized for the specific thing, just if, as if you play an indie tabletop game, for instance. And you, you, the expectation is that you're going to learn the rules for everything, but those are going to be pretty slim because you only have the rules that you actually need for that event. And if you come from a tradition that's systems based, so that 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 a rule system, and you can you don't have to go further into Germany here to 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 a German LARP to to end up with like a four hundred page rule book, because then the idea is and the business model is that we have something that's going to run forever, and we want to have a, a rule set that can uh, that is prepared for any hypothetical situation that might happen. But of course, you have to think about sort of cognitive load as a very important design parameter here. And especially when it comes to safety, safety stuff, that it has to be, you know, design still has to be elegant. Otherwise, what the hell are we doing, you know? And the participants uh, are, are, are um, even participants who, who might culturally sort of want that big universal rule set that will always be the same and who are willing to do the work to memorize it, the 50 different rules, you know? Uh, they, I, I don't believe that they will actually be able to, to deploy it in a situation where they might be in some distress. <laughs> I think it needs to be super simple. Uh, safety rules, as simple as possible. It can be, and that can be like rough and ready. It doesn't have to be elegant to the, to the, to the fiction. Calibration rules, if you can make them elegant and discreet, great, you know. Uh, but it doesn't, it, it, you should be able to communicate it in ideally like a page or less. Uh, for it, and then you have to practice them together every time to have a chance of them working. And it's still yeah. not going to be foolproof. So you're also going to need some kind of culture around how do we take care of each other when we mess up, because we will. Yeah, that's a great point. Another question from the chat. Uh, are there tools made for games that can be used in everyday office situations too? A coworker almost described the X card to me for a work situation. Uh, I think so. I mean, these tools are for moderating social interaction. Uh, yeah. So I could easily see the look down becoming part of a corporate culture, you know? Yeah. That's, a, that's a tool that I think would be very appropriate in, a, in an yeah. office situation. That's a tool that where you have a hand sign for don't engage with me at this moment, basically. Uh, for reasons that I can't go into at this time, I can't participate in this situation. Uh, and that could be, be, that could even, again, it doesn't have to be about distress. That could even be about, I'm about to be pulled into this conversation in a hallway, but I really need to get this email done and I don't want to explain it. And I'm in a process, you know, like I could see that. And I know for a fact that the okay check-in, which is, an, an, uh, you know, just checking in with somebody often from some distance to see if they're okay, would be a great way. And again, like a very subtle way to, to check in with people. I mean, I know this hand sign has another connotation now, but you know, you might want to have another one. Um, also in Southern Europe, it's, it's very rude. So think about context, but, <laughs> but to have this, this, these hand signs for I'm okay. I don't know if I'm okay. Uh, or I, I need, I need to be extracted from this interaction. I know there are a lot of workplaces, unfortunately, where you might end up with customer interactions, for instance, where, where you might need to be able to check in with a coworker. And I, I know for a fact that there are workplaces in which, in which LARPers are using these or have introduced these. Uh, another question, uh, what are the changes that you would most like to see in game design to make games safer? Uh, I, I can take a crack at that. I would like to see uh, every game designer think about how their game is going to be played and include some thought about it, right? Like there are many games that just don't that don't even uh, don't even mention it. And I'm thinking here more about, uh, well, I guess this is appropriate for LARP too, but more for tabletop games that are published or, or shared that just don't, that don't even address this. Uh, so yeah, I would love to see, you know, uh, notes about how the designer thinks a game could be played safer as part of yeah. the text. Just as a, as a, you know, if every game has a how to role play section, maybe it should have a how to play safer section as well. Nice. Yeah, it's yeah, and a kind of a play nice section. But I mean, that sounds like a that doesn't that doesn't sound like a nice 
No, that's not that's something the that parents say when you're not playing nice, but uh, but yeah, something along those lines. I I think just having the designers think about this uh, and and to think about it in a sort of systematic fashion would be helpful. But I mean that's true with every design element. Um, I feel you can often feel when I mean some design is very writerly, and I, I say I, I joke that you can always feel if if a game is designed in a word document or on a whiteboard. Uh, and and I, I think that especially for the ones that are very writerly, um, often there's a, there's a challenge where where the designer hasn't taken the time to think about what happens when uh, when this is act, when these these actions are are performed with bodies in a room, and that's you know and we play with our bodies in a room even when when it's tabletop that that that's no different, and then we have to think about what are the social dynamics that are, might be activated here. But also practical things like you know you need to be able to break a situation because people will need to go to the bathroom or somebody's babysitter is going to call or something. So even for that reason, you're going to need tools to handle um, interruptions. And then when you already have those in place, why not use them to make the game experience more powerful? Because that's ultimately what this is about. This is about this isn't about restricting areas of play, at least not for me. For me, this is very much about enabling, saying, that, okay, I don't think there are, there is actually any kind of content that should be entirely off limits for this medium. Um, I think it's more about how do we design and how do we help the players self-select to the, to the right content and how do we create the, the interaction pass patterns that are acceptably safe for whatever we're trying to engage with. Um, yeah, and then, of course, if the, if your players are everybody and you don't have any control of how and when it's played, then you should have a very high standard of safety of of, of you know safety inclusion in a way. And if you if you know it's going to be these five specific people, and we're going to be in complete control of the social of the physical environment, for instance, okay, then you can then you can work with risk or 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 tough issues in a completely different way. And most most games are somewhere in between. We had, we had talked briefly about proactive versus reactive tools. Mm -hmm. um, are there, uh, can we think around uh, uh, proactive or proactivity in terms of uh, safer play? Um, I think most of the tools require a lot of self-awareness uh, yeah. and I'm wondering if there's an alternative to that. How, how do you mean? Yeah, uh, an alternative to being proactive. You no, know, the alternative to being reactive. Uh, so- Yeah, uh, oh yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, there are some things that have become a little bit of sort of a standard, which which are very close to universally useful. And and um, something the designer, lot designer Karin Edman, has something she calls it the ingredient list. And it's 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 essentially it's kind of a content warning, but it it's not saying oh all of these things are horrible and you should be aware. It's more like just as you know, you should be aware that this you know, these topics, these themes might be, you know, you might not be able, these are themes that you will come in contact with that you can't navigate around in play. And here are some themes that are present in the fiction uh, and in this work that you are probably able to navigate around, but you need to know that they're there. Um, so for instance, like, I don't think that every, uh, I don't think that every every story that has uh, that touches in some way upon infertility uh, should have a content warning. I genuinely don't. But I think it's very useful if you go to a multi-day event where you're playing with your emotions and your body to know about that if you happen to be a person who's been touched by that in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think and that's different. Again, that's about framing it about in a more in a way that's more about access than about danger, you know. Um, and I, I think that that's a, a way that's a way to make self selection easier. Yeah, and I think it, it's uh, that can be used for physical barriers as well. We, we talked about lighting earlier, and yeah. if you say this game is going to be played in bright light, then that's going to let people opt out if that's a if that's a deal breaker for them, rather and than them being surprised. And this is how you learn. Also, as a designer, you won't know. I mean, I've learned most of the things that I know about about LARP safety by playing really well tested games in other cultures where they were disasters <laughs> and that's how we that's how we learn you know and uh, we sure. have a, 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 an erotic horror a queer erotic horror game that, that we run uh, every year now called house of craving uh, and one of the things is about your this you're in this possessed building and the ghosts will touch you all the time so one thing that we learned through you know the hard way is that 
that there are players who are not necessarily aware that they will become completely overstimulated by somebody touching them, even in sort of non-intrusive, casual ways. And even if they're in control of it, just the, the constant sensory input is going to become too overwhelming and they're going to have to stop playing. Ah, OK. But now we all know that player knows and we all know that that's a thing. Now we can warn about that. And this is it's going to be a constant learning process. And that's just that's just the way it is. So we have less than 10 minutes left, and there are still some questions here. So here's one. Uh, as a creator, knowing that your material will be seen by individuals new to tabletop role-playing games and new to safety, how would you highlight proactive safety tools in your game or your module or your adventure? I would make really clear which parts of this are about danger in some way and therefore sort of non-negotiable hard rule, like which, which part of the sort of outer frame and what is about enabling a powerful and joyful play experience. Uh, because then those those are the kinds of rules and mechanics that people will sort of, that aren't about being things being forbidden, but about be, things being inspiring. Oh, like I can use this tool and that will allow us together to create this thing. So I think framing is, is at least really important. And you have to go through those two steps. These things hard no for these reasons. Uh, these things, possibly very much yes. Let's work towards like that enthusiastic consent on these things together. Right, and uh, highlighting communication within the group uh, and yes. issues like uh, you know establishing a baseline of trust, yeah. uh, so that you can have those conversations. And also, just the thing which is uh, about hacking sort of shame. So I think just a, a practical tool that I really believe in is, for instance, uh, is asking people to close their eyes. So for instance, if a facilitator of a, of a game needs to check, is there anyone here who, is, who might not be comfortable with X or Y? You ask everybody to close their eyes, and then you say, if you are uncomfortable with this thing, please raise your hand now. Then they can get a read of the room, but nobody has to out to anybody else You know what, what things are, are hard for whom. And yes, of so course, there's an element of trust. You trust that people won't cheat. But usually, this works really well, and it enables people to do that, and it forces them to have the moment of reflection. Uh, and then you can make adjustments on the fly as needed. Did or you just call that hacking shame? Yeah. That's a great. I love that. That's a great way to phrase that. That's yeah. really smart. Thank uh, you. And uh, and you're right. That like this is this um, reflects back on that the previous question about the person who it, it, uh, doesn't necessarily has it feels pressure to be safe, right? Um, yeah. That's a that's a way to to get around that because you don't you know if it's anonymous then you don't need to necessarily feel any pressure. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't help you in the moment, but uh, certainly uh, in uh, in advance uh, that's that's very could be very effective. So, uh, do you think there are uh, circumstances where we should should remove uh, the ability to opt out or to adjust content? Um. For artistic reasons, uh, yeah, or, for, yes. or for material reasons, I'm thinking of Rosenstrasse, which uh, is a game that has pretty unique safety uh, a, a discussion around safer play that says you're not allowed to to uh, to flinch. You're not allowed to, to back away from this material. It's because it's about well, in that case, it's about um, the Holocaust, right? It's yeah. about uh, the persecution of Jews. Exactly. So, so I think there are topics where it's artistically, you can absolutely make the choice on, our, on artistic and sort of ethical grounds and say, no, to engage ethically with this, this subject matter, you know, this is, you know, this is going to be the rules. But that has to be very clear. And there are some, uh, some, some games where you could argue that just reading the rule set or engaging with the game's existence is a valid way of playing it. So, so a group of friends getting together going through material of a game and getting to the point where they have to start playing and deciding not to play it because they know they can't. If if the game can present that as a valid way of playing that, then I think that would be a great safety design. Not playing it could also be a way of, of playing it, you know what I mean? And But but then you can say, well, if we play it, we think we can do it. You're still going to need a way. You, you know, you need to, do, to be able to flinch. But sometimes art needs to hurt you but then you need to be like you have to have in every step, you know, the choice to do that. I can find it harder that like it's very difficult to leave a theater in the middle of a of a play. And sometimes I would have needed to do that, but I was in the middle of the row and I didn't. And and I think when I'm playing with my friends, even when it's very tough, you know, it, it's still easier than doing that. 
So, so we've got we've got some things right. One of the things that we do uh, in my local group, uh, LARP Shack, is that we uh, we rate games on a teardrop scale, and so we can kind of calibrate around how many teardrops we want to encounter at a particular session. And if everybody is up for for a four teardrop game, then we've got a whole different a uh, palette to choose from. Whereas if yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. wants. You know, they, then you're going in a very serious direction, and that's okay. Exactly. Yeah, right. But and, of and course, it, the things that are going to surprise you, you're going to play something that you thought was pretty trivial or joyful always, or yeah. comedy, and then something, you know, it resonates with something, and that's the most profound. You know, I didn't expect when I went to see everything everywhere all at once in the movie theater to cry and cry. But I, I, I mean, okay, so it's a comedy that is also a beautiful drama. That can happen, and, and games can do that too, and that's okay. You know. Yeah, I, I, I find that uh, uh, I, I, if I'm facilitating what's supposed to be a very light experience, I always try really hard to to make sure that people understand that the, the tools for safer play are are more important because you, you, your guard is down and you don't know what's going to surprise you. In, in and that. especially if you're new to the medium, you don't know that what role playing does profoundly is is ultimately that like it's going to find yeah. the thing it's going to find your heartstrings and it's going to play on it play on them um uh, but lighter games are a good way into that in a way like we just you know, sort of greedy i mean i always want more players kind of way <laughs> if you if you move people profoundly with something very light they can get addicted to that yeah. rush you know <laughs> We have about five minutes. So if you're watching the stream in real time and you have a question, we would love to take it. Uh, but until then, um, do, do you, uh, let's, I think that there's a, a perception that, that, that tools for safer play are there for uh, handling failed states. Something mm -hmm. has gone wrong. And so we're using these tools. Is that always the case? No, in, in my view, no almost the opposite like dangerous situations like a fire or something might be entirely out of our control so i mean is it a failure i mean yes but it could have happened anywhere it might not be a failure of, of your design um but i think we, because we often play in situations with a fair amount of adrenaline uh the using the tool the toolkit is what allows us to do that at all otherwise it would be too dangerous you know otherwise it would be too risky and i mean i i'm i i, I feel like grown-ups are allowed to take risks you know we have sexual subcultures and we have extreme sports and we have a lot of contexts you know and we have professional sports where people take enormous risks with their with their health and safety in ways that we would find completely unacceptable uh within warp and then we have have practices in those fields where where we where people can make sort of adults can consent to certain kinds of football or or sex or whatever it is uh, which is sort of safe enough uh, and i think that those that's the kind of approach we need to have to this as well um, we have about a minute left i want to make sure that you get a chance to tell people again who you are and where they can find your work uh, okay no my name is johanna kolion and it's spelled like it is on the screen and i think in this context i have uh, an essay called i think larp safety design fundamentals and we can also show up on discord afterwards and just put the the link there mm -hmm. but where i walk through a lot of these sort of principles uh, it's in the it's in a japanese uh, role playing journal but it is in english uh, so if you google my name and j a r p s you can also find it there i would recommend that yeah and I'm Jason Morningstar. You can find me at bullypulpitgames.com. Uh, and I think that's probably the best springboard for my work. Uh, this has been great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for so me much. Today. Oh, it's been wonderful. This is my favorite topic, as uh, people may have noticed. <laughs> yes, Sorry about the lecturing tone, but I have a lot of very strong opinions, and they are typically based on testing. That's why we invited you.